The dispute arose when Buchanan Transport, which had carted coal from the Leamington Colliery to the Mount Thorley coal loader for the past 11 years, failed to win a contract to do so in the future. Faced with the downturn in work, the company decided it would have to retrench its 42 drivers. The union believes that those drivers should be given severance pay, a claim that is disputed by the company. But the TWU decided that it would not let the issue slide and beginning on Sunday night, erected pickets at both the Leamington Colliery and the Mount Thorley coal loader. We're hoping to, to achieve some uh, compromise uh, in attempting to resolve the dispute both by Buchanan Transport and Leamington Colliery Management. Um, at this stage, there's been no meaningful uh, attempt uh, by the company, that's Buchanan Transport, uh, to have uh, discussions along those terms. According to Warren Gould, General Manager of the Mount Thorley Coal Loader, no coal is coming in from either Leamington or Wombo Mines. They're still receiving coal from Walkworth and RW Millers at Mount Thorley because this coal comes in on a conveyor belt. Meanwhile, at the Lemington mine, which is owned by CSR and SO, no coal is able to leave the site and is simply building up their stockpile. According to Philip Johnson, the managing director of Buchanan Transport, from June 30 the company will simply operate as a shell while they sort out what to do. He says the company believes it does not have to pay severance pay because under the terms of the Employee Protection Act, they're only forced to pay when retrenchments are caused by a recession. In this case, retrenchments are necessary because of loss of contract. The issue is set to be heard in the Industrial Commission tomorrow week. Milroy is 244 hectares of lush grazing land, 12 kilometres north of Dungog. The land has been owned by members of the Irwin and Howell families since their ancestor, John Irwin, started a blacksmith's shop there in 1855. These days the property carries an 80 cow dairy herd with a 20 can quota and 100 head of beef cattle. The property is now to be sold to settle a family partnership. According to agent Peter Dillon, Milroy's position makes it one of the best properties ever sold in the area. It's one of the larger dairies left in the area. It, uh, it has a very long river frontage, about five and a half kilometres of river frontage, and flats about 250 acres. And for that reason, it's uh, a highly productive dairy farm. Does it put it up there with uh, perhaps one of the best properties that money can buy these days in dairy? I think it does, yes. Certainly in a very safe area. We've got a, a good high rainfall here. A uh, limited amount of irrigation has to be done on the property because of the quality of the country and, uh, and the high rainfall. The property was auctioned in three lots, but although the combined bids equaled $740,000, none of the reserves were met. However, according to the agents, negotiations are continuing with private parties. In the lead-up to the Games, Rick is off overseas to compete in some major American and European competitions. As one of only a handful of professional pilots in the world, his schedule is flat out. Rick, you're off to America on the weekend. What's going to happen over there? Uh, we're competing in a, it's called a manufacturer's meet, an Australian manufactured glider, a Moyes glider, where myself and another Australian, Steve Moyes, and an American are teaming up to compete against all other manufacturers in the world, basically. And any competitions after that? Yeah, we've got several competitions. There's a, a big one in Europe, which is the European Championships. That's in Bassano in Italy, and it starts on the 1st of July. That's the main one. And then um, middle of July, we have uh, the Swiss Open, which is the same site and 12 months prior to the World Championships next year. So it's, it's a very After winning the World Championship in Victoria in February, Rick still has some exciting challenges no, ahead. Not bad, in September, in a public relations stunt, he will be jumping off Japan's Mount Fuji. To Japan, 4,000 metre drop. That's right. I've just. Um, but the prospect of flying in the opening ceremony of the Swan Olympic Lager, Games with his brother doing a offers a new thrill for Rick, who has had no shortage of excitement at the in his sporting career. 
Yeah, that's right. Russell and I have um, just got a job to, to fly at the opening ceremony. And apparently there's a river runs right by the stadium, at uh, the main stadium at the Olympics. So we'll be flying there and possibly flying into the centre of the, the stadium as well. We'll be towing up behind a boat, uh, which will be part of the Australian water ski exhibition team. Three hours dry Issues from to be discussed tonight include the connect account the of the French authorities releasing the gendarme hostages in the caves on the island of Uvea. Connect representative Jacques Buenki says the French government's Bay. view is often heard, but he claims some Canucks were executed and others died from being tortured by the French army. In the village uh, close to the cave, two people died from being tortured. The uh, one died from being uh, tied to a coconut tree during uh, all day, and an old woman died from the bad treatment from the French uh, gendarmes. Uh, during the attack, of course, uh, uh, three of our people were just executed after they have, uh, they have surrendered. Despite the change in the French government, he says the French army is still killing Canucks. He's been invited to Newcastle by the Hunter Broadleft Coalition and will tell his story at the Newcastle Workers Club at 8 o'clock. He says the French government should withdraw its troops and disarm the French settlers' civilian militia. He says Australia should help pressure France to decolonise New Caledonia. And he's seeking financial support from Australian trade unions to help rebuild Canuck villages. Too. Why should Australian trade unions finance the Canucks? It's a matter of solidarity. We are asking the rich countries to help us. But uh, it is not a, uh, uh, we are not asking for charity, we are asking for some help today. And uh, we are asking also to consider us as some future partners because tomorrow we will be independent, we will be able to trade with Australia and I think that we have a so rich country that we will be able to buy a lot of things from Australia. The deadline for submissions opposing the $500 million resort is the 15th of June. That is far too soon, according to many of those at last night's public meeting. Almost 400 packed the Swansea High Auditorium to listen to two speakers, Dr Jim Croft, Chairman of the Board of Environmental Studies at the University, and Doug Lithgow, President of the Northern Parks and Playgrounds Movement. The meeting unanimously passed a number of resolutions which will be presented to Lake Macquarie Council and the Ministers for Planning and Environment. The opponents called for the site to be set aside as a state recreation area and an environmental impact study to be done before any development proceeds. However, the meeting itself is now the object of sharp criticism. It was advertised as a public forum run by the Department of Community Programs and endorsed by the University. Today, NBN and local radio stations received numerous calls complaining that the meeting presented only the negative side of the development. Margaret Henry, who organised the forum, says every effort was made to involve both the developers and Lake Macquarie Council. Approached Gordon Pacific and uh, approaches were made to Mr Gordon, uh, who was to be in Japan, but the company declined to send a representative to the forum, and that was a matter of great regret to us. All right, well then, uh, when it became clear that the meeting was only going to have speakers against the development, should it have gone ahead? Given that we had made every attempt to uh, involve the, the Mayor and the developer and the National Trust, and that we had tried to set up a balanced forum, not to have run a forum where these really important issues were addressed, would I think have been a failure on our part. However, that view is not shared by the University Vice-Chancellor, who says the forum should not have gone ahead. We ought to be in a position to present a balanced discussion, and I'm not sure that the arrangements which were possible for last night's meeting allowed that to happen. So it shouldn't have gone ahead? I think some further consideration ought to have been given to the formation and the shape of the meeting.
currently 23 area health boards in the state, controlling almost 100 hospitals. As a cost-cutting measure, the government wants to reduce that to 10 by amalgamation, and an announcement on the new areas is expected in the next week. The current Northumberland area is comprised of the Curry and Cessnock hospitals and three nursing homes. Residents believe amalgamation will see them swallowed up in a combined Newcastle-Hunter area, and are letting the government know if that happens, it will have a fight on its hands. Spokesperson Sister Judy Seaman. We feel the impact will be that we will be downgraded and we'll have bed cuts, and that's just something that we won't allow to happen in this area. Why would that happen if you were amalgamated with the greater area of well, Newcastle? Well, I think they'll go into specialising um, beds. It'll be certain, certain hospitals will cater for certain types of patients and uh, I'd say most of those will go to the major teaching hospitals rather than the country hospitals. And this is, I think, our greatest worry. Today, almost 1,000 people turned out to a protest meeting at Curry. The meeting called on the government to guarantee there will be no downgrading of local hospitals and opposed any amalgamation with a centralised Newcastle Area Health Board. Some of the strongest criticism came from the current chairman of the Northumberland Area Health Board, Noel Mitchell. Mr Mitchell says the changes won't save the government any money as board members aren't salary. He claims changes are a bureaucratic exercise to act board members appointed by the previous government. Mr Griner is due to visit Curry on Monday. He will be presented with a petition and will face a large number of residents ready to force the amalgamation issue. They're very protective about the hospitals in this area, mainly because the grandfathers of the people that have lived in this area, they uh, worked to get to raise the money for the hospital. They build it and they maintained it. So the people in this area consider the hospitals theirs. While smaller centres including Tamworth, Taree and Bathurst have synthetic hockey fields, Newcastle does not. Because of this, many of our leading players have gone to Sydney or other centres to further their careers in the sport. The Art Union, with a car first prize, is expected to raise almost $150,000. It's hoped work on stage one of the million dollar project will begin in November and be completed in time for next season. The centre will be located on 13 hectares of land between the International Sports Centre and District Park. It will include two synthetic and seven grass fields and is certain to boost local standards. Well, we've already got very strong hockey players at all, all levels and all ranks, men, women, juniors and so on. Some of our teams are going away not having trained on synthetic surface and still winning uh, championships. So once we've got the synthetic surface down, our junior players are really going to come through. When finally completed, the top class venue will play host to state and national championships, which in turn could attract thousands of people to Newcastle. A similar project in Hobart, which opened only 12 months ago, has generated an estimated $4 million in extra revenue for that region. of the accident at the intersection of the Industrial Highway and Ingall Street shortly before midday. Police directed traffic through the intersection while rescue workers used hydraulic cutters to free the victim. Accident investigation police are still interviewing witnesses and the driver of a truck involved in the collision. The man remains in Royal Newcastle Hospital in a critical condition with head and chest injuries. It clipped one car before ploughing into a Citroen carrying foreign students. You're not going to cop anymore, and you want the six percent. NBN News, nightly at six. The forum, 
organised by the university's Board of Environmental Studies attracted more than 60 researchers and academics involved in environmental work. They are hearing from leading researchers on a range of topics covering environmental protection, the impacts of technology and air, water and land management. Amongst the speakers, Dr Diana Day, a researcher for the Department of Water Resources. Dr Day has just completed a seven-year project the effects of industrialisation on the Hunter region for the Australian National University. She says the Hunter has fared reasonably well considering the high proportion of industry using the waterways. The good thing in, about the Hunter is that we've got uh, Glenbourne Dam which regulates the Hunter River and it keeps it, it, keeps it quite uh, at a good water quality level. But uh, if you didn't regulate the water as you did from that dam, then the water quality would deteriorate to some extent in the lower reaches. Dr Day is also outspoken on Lake Macquarie's pollution problems. She says planning needs to occur now so that future growth does not overwhelm the lake. You've got a whole lot of new urban areas to come online as we get a bigger population on the coast. This is inevitable. Now, if you're going to get more and more urban areas around the lake, you're going to get a more and more inflowing of water, sediment and heavy metals or, or other material in the water anyway. So you're going to get increasing sedimentation and an increased management problem. And we've got to manage that lake according to the futures that we see for that lake. A security officer called in the fire brigade around 3.30. By first light, the flames were extinguished, leaving a legacy of heartbreak. Years of council records disappeared in seconds. $200,000 worth of new library books also fed the fire, the heat of which was so intense it buckled steel girders, popping overhead fans from their fixtures. Eyewitnesses reported a series of blasts, thought to be caused by asbestos sheeting exploding in the heat. The rear wall of the chambers was destroyed. Despite the efforts of firefighters, the damage was not contained to the record's wing. The smoke and the heat have penetrated the whole of the building and there is severe damage to the roof, to uh, a lot of the brickwork and to all the furnishings within the building because of the penetration of heat and smoke. Early estimates of the damage bill exceed $2 million. Insurance assessors were at the scene today. Computers and other sophisticated equipment has been rendered useless. Furniture and fittings must also be replaced. Council and staff held an emergency meeting today to set up work areas. The new public library adjacent to the chambers will be used. Meanwhile, foster detectives are investigating the fire. Signs of a forced entry to the library building suggest arson. Fingerprint experts hope to provide a lead in the case. The sale of the West Falls End No. 2 colliery by Coal and Allied is proceeding and by Monday new owner BHP will begin rehiring previous employees and those retrenched from the mine last year. BHP will also be combining operations on the Pacific and Stockton Borehole collieries and rehiring there also in accordance with a seniority agreement thrashed out by the Miners Federation and the company. The Lambton colliery will also take some of the personnel from Stockton Borehole and the company says manpower shedding will be kept to a minimum. Coal and Allied has also reached a major turning point in its operations here, closing down two collieries, Stockrington and Walls End Borehole. The company is determined to continue operations at three others, Chain Valley, Wallara and Mooney further south, saying the economic fate of these is not as precarious as the others. However, major industrial action is looming in the mining industry, with Queensland and the south coast already undertaking a lengthy strike. Miners in the north will meet on Wednesday to decide if they will join them. We'd like to extend my 
The opening of Highfield Azura United's facilities block marks a high point in the club's 25-year history. Member for Swansea and Lady Mayor Ivan Welsh and the Charlestown Richard Bays recognised donations of $50,000 each for Shepherd and Shepherds in the state government. None of the work could have been done without an army of volunteers to turn the corners of the playing field into a fitting building for the state first division rounds. The work won't stop here. Officials have plans for a practice ground, but first priority is to upgrade the existing flood lighting. An overnight ordeal for eight families from Cessnock has ended on a happy note. The 24 bushwalkers went missing at Summersby Falls yesterday, but a massive police search this morning has ended almost before it started. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Two bravery uh, awards are made each year to New South Wales Police and Constable Connolly received both today. The prestigious George Lewis Memorial Trophy is strictly for acts of outstanding bravery while the Peter Mitchell Award includes a section for acts of exceptional courage. Constable Connolly's appearance is different today to the way it was when he lay in a hospital bed at Brewarrina in the aftermath of last year's ugly riots. He recalled the occasion with typical understatement. It was just a... Uh an incident involving a drunken group and police tried to uh, move them on and failed. In the ensuing flare-up, one officer was crippled by a blow which shattered his leg. That's when Constable Connolly moved in. Well, one of my uh, colleagues was struck with an iron bar and once he went down the attack was concentrated on him and I had to shield him from the blows of offenders. The occasion was a proud one for Newcastle District Commander Chief Superintendent Lloyd Noonan, who will retire at the end of the month. The 59-year-old officer received the police medal earlier this year and was instrumental in community-based policing in the region. Strange defeated Nick Faldo by four strokes today in the first U.S. Open playoff in four years. They had finished the regulation 72 holes yesterday and they were tied. The coup ended the civilian government of President Leslie Manigat, inaugurated just four months ago. And within hours, Manigat and his family had arrived here in neighboring Santo Domingo, taking refuge in a luxury hotel. But in the absence of detailed, confirmed information about what's happening in Haiti, the State Department was cautious in its criticism. We are concerned by the reports of the events taking place there. If what took place was a straight military coup d'etat, it would represent a severe setback for the hopes for democracy in Haiti, and we would condemn it. For years in Haiti, long the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, democracy has been nothing more than a hope. The dynasty that ended just over two years ago when Jean-Claude Duvalier fled the country for exile was replaced by a military junta headed by General Namfi and a promise of civilian rule eventually. But the army has stayed uneasy about sharing power, contributing to the chaos last November when violence and bloodshed fatal to more than 30 people ended a first attempt at free elections. <laughs> 